Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Hi, this is Lily, and welcome to Master Leadership, where we connect with leaders worldwide to gain insights on important topics to help us on our journey towards greater significance. If you would like to participate as a guest, or if you have a question that you would like to ask a guest, go to masterleadership.org for more information. Sean Fahey is the founder and CEO of VidCruiter, one of the fastest growing remote recruitment platforms in the world, helping companies attract and hire better talent. Over 75,000 recruiters use VidCruiter to modernize their hiring. Their clients include organizations like Samsung, United Nations, Lionsgate, Chicago Bears, and U.S. Foods. Sean has been in the HR industry for over 10 years, and he started VidCruiter after realizing how slow and inefficient traditional hiring processes were when he was tasked with hiring 200 people in 30 days in 2009. Since then, he has spent a lot of time talking to recruiters worldwide to better understand their unique challenges and find appropriate solutions to make them more efficient when hiring. Our interview will begin right after messages from our sponsors. Have you been wanting to launch your podcast and just haven't found the right resources? I launched Master Leadership Podcast in 2016, and it now ranks in top 1% globally. I've gathered all I've learned and created Master Your Podcast in a Weekend course on Master Your Swag app so that you have everything you need to share your voice with the world, minus those excuses. So download Master Your Swag app on Google or Apple platforms to access the Master Your Podcast course and launch your podcast this weekend. Welcome, Sean Fahey. How are you? Hi. Well, thank you for having me, Lily. I appreciate it. Well, we're excited to have you all the way from Canada. Up north here. (laughs) Well, are you ready to pour into our listeners, Sean? Yeah, 100%. Awesome. All right. So tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now. So I'm not really sure when the path started. It might have been in high school at some point when I won some random student election or something. But I currently run an organization of 200 people around the world. And we sell recruitment software to all sorts of organizations globally for interview compliance and interview frameworks and helping organizations make their interview process more seamless, basically. Which is very needed. Yeah. Um, So what's the organization? That's called VidCruiter. So how do you make the process more seamless? We have a lot of different tools that assist depending on who needs what kind of help. But the main idea is that we auto schedule your interviews. We help with the creation of your panels. We help put your interview questions through the software into the right panel at the right time, delivered to the right manager, so that when that candidate walks in in this new hybrid world, whether it's in a video conference or in person or whatever kind of interview you're having, that the manager or the managers or the hiring managers or the HR team has the right question set for that interview at that time so that they're evaluating them through a structured interview methodology to ensure proper compliance of and proper interview methodology, basically. So process is super important. And I love efficient process, which is what you made this process more efficient because it could be overwhelming. 100%. It can be. And that's exactly what we do is we enhance recruiting processes, okay. uh, whether it's interviewing or applying or screening. We have tools at every stage, but that's what we do in a nutshell, really. Where can we get more information? Everything is on vidcruiter.com, video, recruiter, stick those two words together. It's vidcruiter. Our core business principle is to build and to help with recruitment process modeling. So we actually model the product to your process. That's how deep in the process we go. You've grown to 200 employees worldwide. Yes. Vidcruiter, we started in 2009 with the idea, but it was just an idea at first. And I wasn't from this background. So I actually spent three years analyzing how this could work, and officially kicked off the company in 2012. 
before that, I just had a different kind of company. I was in retail. So I had a series of retail products and retail kiosks and malls and just doing small business that I had started from school, basically. I've read that the best advances in certain disciplines come from outside of that discipline, which I find to be true time and time again. So in 2009, you started. Now you have 200 people. How has your leadership changed? What has been some shifts that you've had to make? I think it has a lot to do with what you're doing in your day-to-day tasks. So a great book that I read is called E-Myth, The Entrepreneur mm-hmm. Myth. And at first, you're working a lot in the business. You're just doing everything. And as your business grows, uh, you have to start building processes around making sure the team is efficient and doing the right things. So one of the things that I've evolved is looking at both aspects all the time. So should we focus on improving the process or should we just do it manually and not build a process around making this part of the business more efficient? And having that sort of dual look at the organization at every stage and how it adapts and changes I found is one of the things that's changed the most in my role. But because I can do both of those things, what tends to happen is the people that follow or that work with me, the fact that you'll get in the weeds and help with whatever any entry level employee has to do and you've already done that job gives some credibility to the people that join your organization. It's like, no, we're going to do this. I've done that. Here's how we do it. Here's the process that we've built. Please give me feedback on how to improve that process. And so, Almost every department and stage of the company I've done so that I know how to explain it and I can live and I understand the pain that those employees have and try to make their jobs easier. As you were saying, you understand the pain. I wrote down, you understand pain points because you've done it before. So you're able to step into their shoes and empathize. I love that you're open to feedback. That's key for leadership, isn't it? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, oftentimes people assume that you won't listen or that They just are cogging in the wheel or something like that. But I've oftentimes jumped into different roles or teams and helped them and sort of find out what's causing issues or delays or what's making it harder for them to do their job in the day to day. And then when they tell me, we try to immediately fix it because there shouldn't be friction points. And so to unblock friction points or parts of the organization that aren't flowing properly is what I call it. It's like this flow state. They talk about that when you're running, you know, like you get in a right. flow state. I find that that also applies to organizations. So if there's a friction or it's not flowing, then something's wrong, right? And that's the indicator to look for, okay, well, how do I determine what to solve? And then to apply the leadership of just fixing that problem tends to really help my team members sort of get on board with, I go, wow, you know, we said there was a problem here. It got fixed immediately. This is a fun place to work because we're actually listening to the challenges that people are having every day. Beautiful. And listening is another key thing that I listen for, because one of the reasons I started this podcast is to continue to learn how to listen, which I'm still on that journey, Sean. I don't know about you, but I can always learn and expand in that area, right? Yeah. I mean, the key to listening is to listen for what is the underlying issue. And that's a hard skill to get. You're right. It's not that easy to understand that there is an actual issue here. And what is the actual underlying issue that's causing this problem or issue or the client's not happy? And I try to always look at what's the underlying issue. How can I solve this? Not just for this one situation that's causing this friction point, but in a way in which this situation would never arise again. It's that listening to not just what they're saying, but where's that coming from? I think that's the key to listening. That's deep listening. It's interesting in this climate of what people call the great resignation. There are different views on this. How has that affected what you do or how do you approach that? I was actually on a panel yesterday and one of the leaders there had something really smart to say. If there's a great resignation happening, let's prepare ourselves to hire everyone who wants a new job and to look at it from that point of view and to say, let's position the company to be open for people who are looking for change. That's one aspect. The second aspect is how do we ensure that our current staff feels engaged? Disengaged people will tend to quit. If you're engaged in your organization, which has a whole bunch of other meanings behind it, but you basically like working there, you're not going to quit. Mm -hmm. So making your 
staff engaged or having an environment that creates engagement is sort of one of the priorities. And then with this resignation, using that to your advantage to receive, receive all these people. Yeah, exactly. That would come work for you. One of the things that I would share with other people who are sort of HR practitioners or leaders is do an exercise in your mind of what would happen tomorrow if you knew that in two months from now, 40% of your staff would quit. How would you prevent that from happening? What would you change? If all of a sudden you realize that maybe not everyone at work's happy, and if you lost 40% of your staff, we're talking about a substantial negative effect to your business. Mm -hmm. And going through the exercise of that, what if, and then what could I do to stop that and prevent that? And how do I make sure that my staff feel engaged? And what would I change immediately? We did the exercise the other day, and we already just noticed like little details of things that we can tie together to make the organization better. As an example, our frontline staff, we have a lot of frontline support agents. They don't always hear direct feedback from clients. However, our customer success team always hears that direct feedback and they always praise the support team because they love them. Right. But the support team's not hearing that message. And the support team sometimes feels disengaged because you know they're just chatting and it's not the most glamorous job in some cases so what i just sort of connected those two thoughts together and say why don't we take these little short video clips of all the clients saying how much they love support stick them together in a video and then play that at our sort of holiday party Mm. so that in front of the whole company the support team would feel like hey you're making a huge contribution to our organization that you may not realize and here's a hundred clients saying it yeah, adding value to your team. Exercise. Powerful. Exactly. But that exercise came from what if all that team was to quit tomorrow? So, Sean, that brings me to you help recruit top level people. Do you also coach organizations that need it? Like, if they're so, like, listen, Sean, I have to hire these people, but I don't even know what questions to ask. We have partners that have IO psychologist backgrounds that can help with interview guides and interview builders based on competencies that you're looking to hire. So you just plug in what kind of competency you're looking for, and then it pumps out the interview questions that you should ask. And then we feed that into the system so that your team has the right interview questions for that specific interview that you're looking to do. Now, I know you have strategies to attract top talents. Can you share some of those with us? I think it's about brand engagement within the talent community for what are you showcasing to the world about working for your organization? So... We constantly get feedback that our Glassdoor reviews are really good. And for the most part, they are generally really good. And we try to encourage our staff to put a review online because that's the first place candidates will check. And then on our career page, we try to talk about what it is to work for our organization. What kind of organization are we? And we want to try to paint a picture of who we are, what makes us special, Uh, Like we mentioned, we're based in Canada, so everyone has a hockey jersey as part of our theme to work here. If you work here after your probation, you get a hockey jersey. It's kind of like a fun thing, but it's like now you're part of the team officially. So little things like that that we can do that other organizations may not be able to easily do just make us stand out and connect with people on a different level. So these are the kinds of things that we're doing from the first time that you apply, having the right messaging and continuing that messaging all through the interview process as you get hired. And making sure that we deliver on the promise that we said at the beginning so that that message is consistent throughout all the different channels of that the candidate goes through. And delivering on the promise, that's integrity, which is an important value, an important pillar in leadership. You got it. Love it. All right. So as a lifelong learner, Sean, what are you learning right now? It's constant. You know, yesterday I was at a different panel and I learned about other aspects of HR that I hadn't always considered. We are living in the HR space for as our business. But I think the key to aspect of lifelong learning is to listen for ideas that you can incorporate into your life and or your business or your day to day and to have an open mind, you know, about what it is that you could do to expand or grow or nurture I read a really good book called Learned Optimism, and it teaches you the concept that optimism is a learned behavior. And that if you learn about optimism, that opens the door to this continuous learning experience. So it's kind of like you need that first to be able to become a lifelong learner. I find that optimism is the door that allows the learning to happen. And if the door is closed, then you can't have the exercise of having 
that new knowledge come in because you're sort of closed off to the idea of improving or changing. So I take it back one step before and I say, you know, focus on being more of an optimist and there's ways you, you could do that that can benefit you. And then from there, you will automatically become a lifelong learner without even trying because it's just becomes part of your new persona. I love what you said. You find that optimism is the door to learning. I also feel that pain and suffering could be as well. <laughs> well, well, there's the other side as well. Yeah. <laughs> right. If we really take that on, it's about self-awareness, right? When right. we look at that and say, why is this happening? And to learn that I am the cause of my life. Um, but that comes through learning. I've learned a lot of lessons when I've been at a point of suffering or pain and also at optimism. Because when I'm in that state, I'm just more open. But that's a now, good point. That's what I was referring to before is that I'm learning when I see these pain points. Yeah. But I'm optimistic that I can solve the pain point. So it's both really. Yeah. Now that you mentioned that. Yeah. You know, I love how you think. And I'm a process person too. I used to have an early intervention agency and I was always thinking about how to make things more efficient and how to automate things. I just wanted to press a button and everything falls in place. I didn't get there though. That's exactly how the idea for VidCurter happened is someone asked me to hire 200 people in five years. Right. And I said, well, what if we could do that in 30 days? Hmm. And they're like, well, we need to have a rigorous process. It's all across the country. It's this, you know, and I was like, well, okay, but what if I still did that in 30 days? That's sort of where the idea from the product came from is to automate, click one button, have your finalists show up. Beautiful. Love yeah. that button clicking situation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, Sean, when you think of leadership today, what most concerns you and what are you most hopeful about? The thing that concerns me the most is probably the impact of social media or bite size information, like these 10 second clips, whether it's Twitter or TikTok or Instagram or Facebook or what have you. It's difficult to see above the noise and there's too much noise it helps you sort of get out of that area if you can sort of think above that or get outside of that sort of constant noise to really have a more thoughtful process of what's happening how to help what to do and i'd be caught up in so much of this day-to-day -day and these little bite-sized sort of information bits those can help and they have good opportunities in other cases but that would be sort of one of my things that makes it harder for leaders to really stand out is they're too inundated with too much information that's not helpful. And so what do you suggest to stay above the noise? How do we do that? Well, I use Twitter as an example, but I mute a lot of words. Hmm. So you can mute words in your feed so that you never have a word that is against or counterintuitive to what you want to be learning about so that you can sort of curate your learning approach to just that information source okay. and just the topics that you want. And nothing else can come inside of that to change the outcome of your perspective in a negative way. You do want some divergent ideas to help create new ideas, but it's more about positive sources of information. So that's one of the things that I've done to help expand and make sure that it flows within the right area. What are you most hopeful about when you think of leadership? There's a lot of cool leaders that are doing a lot of cool things. Now that the world is so connected, you can see other mentors in all different parts of the world and all different facets of life. And so that gives more hope to people who may in the past have not seen leaders that they can identify with. Now that we're a global community and you can have different leaders at different stages of life and different aspects of doing different things, that there's more opportunity for someone who's looking for that mentorship without even having to meet that person in person. Right. You know, I come from a very small place, a small community, and I was lucky that I ended up doing a master's degree in Florida. And one of the things that stuck out to me is I met all these different people who were very really successful that I wouldn't have met where I was living in a small remote place when I grew up. And having that connection with these people enabled me to expand my horizon and thinking. And now you can get that on YouTube. Right. Right. You don't need to travel 5,000 miles to get to the other side of the planet to get this kind of information. So the ability to get mentorship online for the kind of resource and knowledge that you want, basically the Internet, makes me very hopeful about new leaders and the information that people can get to step up and become better leaders. Yeah. 
There definitely is a lot of information out there. And I started this podcast in 2016 because I saw the need to up-level what we do in leadership through conversations like this so we can collectively grow. As I listen to what you say and how you lead, adding value to people, listening, being someone of integrity, those are pillars in leadership. And so I'm super grateful that you're giving us some good nuggets here. Now, in your leadership journey, what's been the best advice you've heard? The best advice I ever heard was to set up your life so that you succeed no matter what happens. So it's just that simple. It's just set it up so that you succeed. Okay. So how do we do that? Like, that sounds great. <laughs> sounds fantastic. Okay. But how do I receive that and really make it a part of what I do? That's a lifelong learning experience, right? That's the journey of, okay, where do I start? And the first place that I started early on was, okay, what am I learning and where am I learning it from? So I'm learning from music that I listen to. Okay, well, what kind of music do I want to listen to? All right, well, I'm going to stop listening to music that has lyrics uh, that's not okay. teaching me right headspace that I need to be in. That was like at the very beginning. And then it's, where am I getting my information from? Okay, mm. well, I decided not to buy a TV for like 20 years. I didn't have a TV because the information I was getting was not putting me in the right direction for the success that I wanted because the information I was getting wasn't in line with what my goals were. So where can I get a source of information that starts to lead me into the path that I would like? Well, Twitter is one of those. So because I can choose and curate the type of information I get, then I start to get information from that source and only that source. I'll give you an example of that specific use case. I was an associate professor in a local college here, and they called me at the last minute and said, hey, how would you feel about teaching a fourth year marketing class? The professor just had a sickness and the class doesn't have a teacher. We have two weeks to fill this class. However, it's the fourth year advanced marketing class, and we need someone to fill that role. Now, I've taken two classes of marketing my whole life. I mean, I did an MBA, but I'm not qualified to teach the most advanced marketing class right. with the fourth year students. I just said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And so I went to Twitter and then I found every single marketing professor from Harvard, MIT, every single major university around the world. And I curated my feed to only read what they were reading. And I would read that two, three hours a day, every day. And within a few weeks, I started to learn almost every single major concept of marketing, every new item of marketing, because they were sharing all the information about that topic nonstop. So I still had a curriculum I had to follow, which was, you know, that's why they right. knew that I could do it. But then I would start to bring in like, well, here's what they're doing at Harvard marketing. And here's what this team is doing. And here's what's happening with internet marketing. And here's all the different topics. Of marketing. And the class was blown away that the knowledge that I had about marketing was better than what they were expecting and better than what the previous professor had taught, because I just plugged into the right information network to be able to deliver that content from this source that exists on the internet. That analogy and that example is I needed to be really good at marketing at the top level really quickly, but that same concept, applying that to your life in terms of what is the success that you want, where is that going to drive you? Is it healthy, exercise, eating, you know, sleeping? There's a tribe or community that speaks to that language and lives it and then just join that group and then you'll start to think like them. And then that'll get you to the next path of success that you want and the next path of success that you want. And so that's kind of how I would do that. Beautiful. Love it. Thank you so much. Now we have a surprise here, a question from a former guest. So Karen Kenny wants to know, what is a failure that you've encountered and have learned from? I've had many of those as well. The one that I've learned from the most in terms of a failure would be, failing is actually not that bad. I've had a couple of major failures in my business career before this company when I was first starting. And looking back, that's what built the character to be able to keep going and persevering and going through that. And so realizing that failure is part of the process. And when you're in that moment of failure where you failed or your business failed or whatever happened, you feel so down or depressed or whatever feeling that you're feeling. It's to somehow reach in in that exact moment to realize this is a learning opportunity and you needed to fail because you didn't know what you were doing. And so you weren't going to succeed. You didn't have the right mechanism. You didn't have the right framework for winning or what I was talking about where it was guaranteed to happen. You didn't have that because you didn't know what you were doing. It's kind of like, I don't know, sometimes people assume that the failure is bad and they should have not failed. And they, 
you know, they're down about it. But it's like, okay, well, that's like the equivalent of just tomorrow morning, go run a marathon and climb Mount Everest or whatever challenge that you've never done before and do that perfectly. You can't do that. So why do you have this concept that you should be able to perfectly achieve business outcome without having walked a step yet? This doesn't make any sense. So you just have to have a logical reasoning behind what happened. And to keep that logical sort of like the balance to the optimism is like being stuck in reality, which I also say you also need to do that as well. And find a way to ground yourself so that you don't get emotionally attached to that failure outcome. Hmm. And how important is coaching in this process? That's one of the keys that I was saying before is that you could find any coach, any mentor anywhere to, you know, get that coaching where you need to. I've had a lot of different coaches at different stages in my life. I think that there's a time and place where you need a coach and there's time you may not have the right coach to get you to the next level. And you got to also realize that, you know, I have two or three people that I look up to and I read everything they say and I follow everything they do. They're the ones that help open my eyes to what I need to do. And all of my mentors I've never met or talked to. Mm. It's just from reading what they read and understanding what they're thinking on the internet. Well, thank you, Sean. Now, as a listener of this podcast, what's a question that you would like a future leadership guest to respond to? Like, what are you curious about? I would say, what have you done in your life to ensure that you have become successful? A lot of people don't think about the process of themselves being successful. One example I give you is like no TV, right? That's a super easy one that everyone can relate to. But that's one step of guaranteeing success. And think about your own life and what are the processes that you've implemented in your own life that have helped you become successful that you could share with other listeners. Yeah, Because it's easy for me to throw the TV out, but is it easy for me to spot flow decision-making processes that are difficult to find in an organization that I need to solve because someone made a complaint? You know, the more of these that you learn and then apply to your life, the more successful you become. Tweaking your habits. Habit tweaking, exactly. And sometimes we need help because we don't know that our habits are bad. Exactly. As a matter of fact, I had a wonderful coach and mentor. He posted something on TikTok, giving us uh, awesome nuggets. And meanwhile, he was drinking a Pepsi. And I'm like, all right, love the nuggets. Stop drinking Pepsi. (laughs) You'll thank me later. So what I'm saying is that sometimes we don't see our blind spots or we don't see how we can get better and we need people speaking into our lives. So having that inner circle of people that we can call or people that we invite to speak into our lives, that's super important. I agree that that is also an important part of leadership and developing yourself into the next level. Wonderful. All right, Sean. So is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? No, I mean, I think this is a great podcast in terms of what you're doing and to educate people on leadership for people who are in this sort of vein of thinking to keep researching and looking into it. And uh, it's a good self-development world to start moving up to into different levels. And I think this is awesome. Well, thank you. And so vidcruder.com. That's it, vidcruder.com. So if we want some great processes on getting top-notch people, that's where we need to go. Sean, thank you so much for adding value to us. It's been a great conversation. Thanks, Lily. Thanks for having me. In closing, here's a quick message. Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.